Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Friday Morning at the Fun House alongside Mr. Martin Popoff. As always, Martin, what's yes. going on this morning? Morning, sir. Morning, sir. Well, lo looking forward to this, this cool thing about foreign languages and stuff. Sitting here in Canada, of course, where we have uh, we have uh, we have a, our own our own semi foreign language. Uh, who's also sending a lot of smoke down to us lately, right? And I think that's yes. going to continue all summer. So. Yeah, the smoke screens are coming. The smoke signals are coming down. Although I haven't seen it or or smelt it uh, since it originally happened. I, I heard that we were supposed to get like another wave of that, but it never came this week. So I don't know how the fires are doing up yeah. there. But uh, it's been pretty clear here. Although we're, <laughs> as always, uh, the forecast is full of rain and thunderstorms for the next like week whether any of it actually happens where I live in the Hudson Valley remains to be seen because yesterday was supposed to be 80 something chance, chance of rain. We didn't have a drop and it was actually sunny all day. So now it's yeah. dark and cloudy out right now. They're calling for rain on and off all day. Whether it happens, I don't know. That's the way it's been going here. It's like they call for rain all the time and it never actually rains. So whatever. Right, yeah. Anyway, well, yeah, it's going to be super hot and dry mostly up here. So it's going to be, it's going to be a rough summer. I'm apparently at this time last year, we're already at 10 times the amount of uh, area burned uh, equal to the entire size of Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island uh, combined. So, yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. Is yeah. the humidity uh, here with you? Cause it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty humid. Yeah, for yeah. sure. It's been dry. And now the humidity they're saying the next couple of weeks is going to be really humid. So a typical hot and sticky beginnings of the summer here in New York. So that's, that always has been the case historically last year was not as humid, more dry, but we'll see what happens anyway. Now that the weather report is uh, finished here, <laughs> uh, we've got an interesting show. So this is one that uh, Martin and I have been percolating for a couple of weeks. So we got to talking about non-English language bands music or bands who are not of the english language country speaking countries who have chosen to speak in their native language or in english but that's not their original language of choice uh and so martin and i started talking about those bands that you know like what's it like to listen to a non-english speaking band try to sing in english or to sing in their own native uh, language and how does that affect our enjoyment or not of the music of their recorded works and and how many of these bands have like actually really like made it big in the main English speaking countries so that's kind of the the basis for the show today uh, I'm gonna have Martin kind of expand on that a little bit and uh, before we start getting into we picked out 10 bands each to kind of highlight all of this and from various countries so Martin why don't you uh, kind of take it from there yeah, it's pretty interesting. I'm, you know, the, the over the umbrella concept is the pros and cons of this, you know, when we're into it, when we're not, why we're into it, why we're not, you know, how do they make different music as well? Um, how utilitarian is it for an English speaking person to 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 listen to a band in another language? Um, you know, I tend to be, you know, I, I come from a, a, a Canadian tradition or definitely a Western Canadian tradition of being kind of hostile towards having to learn a second language because all through high school we had to somewhat learn French right and you know as a kid you're thinking I'm never going to use this or whatever I wish kind of I had it now because Quebec City and Montreal are two of the coolest cities in all of Canada right um, you know so so you do get more uh, employment prospects in Ottawa as well if if you learn French sort of thing so French is a well that's the one I'm going to start with here so I'll just dive in because I think the concepts will happen as we go here so my first band I don't have any props anymore. I had a lot of these albums before. Uh, Sortilage, Trust, Warning. I had all this stuff. But Sortilage is the one I wanted to talk about the most because I think they made the most classic, classic album and the most utilitarian for an English-speaking person when they did the English version of uh, Metamorphose. It's funny because Metamorphose, 1984, of course, I'm probably pronouncing this completely wrong, but the funny thing is Warning this band called Warning from France also had an album called Metamorphose. And my second example, Baron Rojo from Spain, had an album called Metamorphosis in, in 1983. So pretty strange. But anyway, uh, so, so Sortilege had an EP. They had later stuff as well. The, the, um, the next album was not so good, uh, Alarm de Heroes. Um, I, it, it's funny, you know, come from Canada. I'm supposed to be able to say this stuff. But I, as soon as I hear it, I, I, I like... 
I like get stage fright and I just blow it. Right. Um, Maybe we're going to butcher but, some names and titles today. That's just the way it yeah, is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, but no, this, this one album is an absolute, absolute classic. The vocals are amazing. The riffs, the grooves. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's like a late period new wave of British heavy metal album, but it's leaning into that new wave of Swedish heavy metal sound a little bit. So there's something magical that sort sort of uh, captures. And, and is it because they are from, you know, a slightly, removed non you know standard metal market britain canada the states australia germany germany is going to uh you know uh, factor into this a little as well uh and then there's the the case of trust they did the same sort of thing you know trust uh, gave us nico mcbrain which is kind of odd but um they also had a french language version of repression and that came out 1980 repression i didn't like trust very much i didn't think they were that good um you know, I, and I've always thought France had a little bit of a, a little bit of an ACDC vibe to what they did, a little bit of a biker metal vibe to what they did. And a little bit of that ACDC vibe goes over to Switzerland as well with Crocus, right? Uh, sort of thing. Uh, so Trust is in there as well, but they had a bunch of French language stuff. And then the other album I want to say that I really, really, really wish there was an English language version is the second of the two self-titled albums from this band called Warning, 1982. That thing, Orange Cover absolutely incredible incredible um it's almost like stadium rock but still pretty heavy metal great production on it um great performances that's one i really really wish would have uh, come out as well of course uh in modern times we've got uh, gojira scarb uh, um there was nightmare early on as well there was volcano early on but uh yeah if i was to recommend anything uh, for for an English speaker who's who's like, nope, I don't want any foreign languages, the, the English language sort of edge. But if I was to rec recommend two albums from that whole great, magnificent past of this, it would be that album plus the second warning album. So that's my first one. Cool. I mean, you bring up a, a great point right there about people who the blockers go up as soon as they find out that the vocals are in a non-English language, they just refuse to listen to it. Yeah. I come me, in, that's I come, me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah. I generally am pretty forgiving of that. I, I have learned, I guess, and, and, no. and a lot of my list yeah. is very prog heavy. So that was the kind of learning pointer for me to be able to start accepting bands that are singing in non-English language. It was when I first really started to get heavily into international prog, but you know what, Martin? I talk to a lot of prog fans who still will not listen to Italian bands, Spanish bands, French bands, Japanese bands. As soon as they hear that the vocals are in a non-English language, they're like, no, just can't do it. Yeah. So you're not alone. There's tons of people that are like that. And, uh, oh, you know, me, hold on a second. Call it out of here. <laughs> For me, I, I tend to... I think the only way that I've been able to overcome it is to say, okay, well, let's treat the vocals as just another instrument, right? Because, well, you know, yeah. do we, we don't really speak guitar or, you know, it's like we know the notes, but it's not like we, it, it, there's a message there, right? So I think that was my key to kind of overcoming it early on. So we're, we're talking France here. So I decided to go uh with the band Ange, okay a-n-g-e and maybe mona lisa as well they're two of the most prominent prog bands from france uh for Ange, though christian de camps is the was the singer of the band one of the interesting things about the french especially the french prog bands who sang in in french <clears throat> the language and again i'm going to be comparing a lot of these languages uh, with a lot of the bands that i'm going to be talking about and why why some of them are more successful for us English speaking ears and why others aren't. <clears throat> I find the French language, specifically in these in this band, and even some of the band I mentioned before, Mona Lisa, uh very angular at times. They're very emotive. And I think the vocal style oftentimes borders on theatrical. So I, I think that, and musically speaking, you know, a lot of these bands, they, they hit like in 72, 73, like uh, Caricatures, their first album was 72. Then they have uh, Emile Giacote. I'm probably pronouncing all this wrong. Par les Fils de Madrin. I mean, these are some of their classic albums. How about, I'll try this one, Martin. Au Delà du Delire. <laughs> probably totally wrong. Anyway, uh, most of these albums are very much influenced by like Genesis, right? King Crimson, Moody Blues, that sort of thing. So when you have this kind of lush symphonic music and these kind of 
loopy French vocals that are bordering on, you know, theatricality and almost like um, the band are performing in a play, right? So here you got the band, the music, the musicians, and then the, the singer is doing these kind of like presentations. I can totally see why folks could be uncomfortable with that. Even though I've grown to appreciate these type of, you know, bands who are singing in their native language, I will say out of some of the ones that I'm going to talk about today, I'm still not 100% there with the French bands because of that. So even myself, even though I say I'm pretty accepting, there, there's a little blockers up because I think for like Ange, and they're not the only two French bands, uh, but Ange and Mona Lisa are the ones that I'm most familiar with. And I do like the music. I like, I have a bunch of their albums from both. I don't listen to them all that often because I think there is something there that's kind of not really hitting home. So again, I'm with you. It, it's hard. It can be really yeah. hard. Even if you love the music, but that yeah. singing, you're kind of like, and, he did, and these guys don't have bad voices at all. But there's, to me, there's something about the French language that I find a little almost jarring, I guess, yeah. a little, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I I think I think people from France and French Canadians from Quebec and and English people have all agreed uh, and and ridiculed uh, literally the French language when it comes to heavy metal. They basically say it doesn't fit for heavy metal. I mean, it's it's one that I've heard lots of funny stuff about. Well, that's a, that's an absolute great point, because so, again, let's compare. Let's talk about that. So heavy metal and Prague. So I think it works a little better in Prague because Prague of the nature of the music. But like I'm, I'm sitting here trying to picture christian de camp singing for a metal band and i'm like that won't work at all for me anyway right it just yeah. doesn't match it's a it's a little too playful it's a little too theatrical for that so it just doesn't doesn't work for me but yeah okay so so my second example is is uh baron rojo from spain they're pretty much considered the big famous one um you know i i had those records uh at the time larga vida uh al rock and roll uh, and uh, Metamorphosis are the are the two. The second one has a much better production on it. Um, I wanted to pick this band because uh, it 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 does that thing that I'm happy for these non standard metal market bands to do. And I remember hearing those as a kid. I think it's an '81 and an '83 album. These two albums. Um, I remember them them doing chord changes and ideas and cool transitions and and breaking rules with choruses and pre-choruses and stuff that you don't normally get. So I think this is this is the lesson for people to be less xenophobic and travel and see and see these different things and and try these different bands. I think Baron Rojo is a good example of that. But it's it's a weird band. It's it's almost like and it also at the same time does that thing that you don't like from these bands which is being kind of behind the times and seem to be out of it or not or not you know not knowing the rules sometimes is good and not knowing the rules sometimes is bad right so they do a little bit of both um but essentially they do like an infectious sort of um biker metal sound i mean at, i remember there was also obus uh angelus de, uh, del inferno maga de oz tierra santa um yeah, so that's that's the Spain situation. You don't get a lot of Spanish bands. Of course, as time goes on, you know, uh, well, actually, I watched a video last night, which was kind of interesting about why English has sort of taken over the world. And, and it has a lot to do with British colonialism. Uh, you know, the Dutch were just as as colonialists, but the Dutch were after natural resources. The British settled in these places. Right. So, uh, you know, Canada, the States, India, you know, all over the place, South Africa. Right. Um so that happened. Uh, American culture is a huge part of it. The language of business is kind of a part of it as well. The language of the Internet is part of it as well. Um, so there's all these reasons uh, that English is is kind of growing and growing and growing. Is it a good thing? I mean, it makes us all more homogeneous. Right. Um, so it's probably not not the best thing in the world. But uh, uh, I guess the reason I bring this up is that as metal culture went on and on and on, as as you know, will will become a concept as we talk to talk about some of these bands. Um, we realize eventually you get lots of good bands from these places and you fully expect them all to speak, uh, sing in English and they do a good job of it. So all of a sudden you're just getting great bands from all these different countries, even though English isn't their first language. And all this. And now it doesn't matter where, where anybody's from. Right. Whereas yeah. that was always an important thing back in the day. Now it's like, ah, they could be from anywhere and who cares? Cause we all sound similar. Right. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yep. So yeah, it's funny because not a lot of Spanish bands of note, right? And uh, yeah. my father's side of the family is from Spain. So it's, you know, 
Spanish was always spoken in my house, not really by me, right? It's like just like you with having to take French, I had to take Spanish in school. Yeah. I took it all throughout, uh, you know, junior high, high school, even a little bit in college. You know, whatever, because I grew up, you know, my grandparents spoke Spanish all the time and my father spoke it fluently. And, you know, so uh, so my band here for Spain is a band called Crack. Only album they ever released. The name of the album is Si Todo Hiciera Crack. All right. Spanish vocals here tend to be quite lush and calming. So uh, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit very different from Italy. So oftentimes people kind of look at uh, when it comes to the prog scene, the Spanish and the Italian bands kind of have this like romantic type of delivery to their music. The music tends to be a much more melodic and, you know, the Spaniards too, uh, very basic with, as far as like utilizing traditional instrumentation and arrangements and things like that that this uh, tradition is very very big in spain one of the things i've learned over the years um and i find that the music of especially this band not quite as theatrical as like the french so there's a little bit different so the vocals are kind of a little more calming a little more lush a little more dialed back but on that same token just like i mentioned the french bands were very much influenced by like say genesis and whatnot here you have the they have two vocalists in the band Alberto Fontaneda and Mento Hevia. I hope I said those correctly. One guy sounds like Peter Gabriel. The other guy sounds like John Anderson. So if anybody watching ever thought what it would be like to have Peter Gabriel and John Anderson kind of appearing in the same band on the same album, playing off each other, that's kind of what you get here. So it's really, really interesting. And I would say this album is highly listenable. There's nothing harsh about the vocals. They're very calming, pleasing to the ears. I just, and again, maybe I'm biased because I'm half Spanish, but I find the Spanish language much, much easier to, to digest in any style of music. It's just, it, there's something about it um, and it works really, really well. So uh, yeah, not a lot of Spanish prog albums, but I would say Crack, the debut one and only album is definitely one to check out. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. My next uh, country to visit is uh, Germany, um, you know, except... Um, you know, except being the baby scorpions and uh, grave digger being the baby except that's the way we always looked at it. Right. Um, and the other thing we always looked at is it, it always seemed that Germany was was the the best or the next in line after the English speaking uh, countries because they always loved metal. Um, yeah. They got into it, you know, not particularly early. I mean, we we essentially had Scorpions for a long time and then accept and then, you know, lots and lots as time goes on. We eventually get a big power metal scene out of that uh, out of out of Germany as well. Um, but it always seemed that um, they had uh, a little bit of that uh, of that same, you know, it, there was always high regards sort of for the Scandinavian sound as well, where you got that European, we used to call it that Teutonic sound, you know, Geronimo riffs, that whole thing that I keep bringing up. Right. Um, so, so there was always something kind of special about Scorpions. Um, you know, they were doing things that you wouldn't get out of a Western band and you were happy about it. The other thing is they all basically decided right away, pragmatically sing in English. Uh, and that's how you're going to have a career. So, you know, and I always tell the story and it, it's funny. I had, I had my one rant, Ramstein interview, uh, Ramstein, whatever, uh, you know, and it was actually with a translator, which was pretty crazy. Right. And, and so there's a band that almost feels like, um, I, I almost feel like their popularity in North America is because the German language is, is kind of amusing and it sounds like an instrument and especially on something like Rams Ramstein, which is, uh, you know, which is very, very uh, industrial. Right. Um, so it's, so it's kind of cool. It goes along with, it's very rhythmic. Right. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I think Germany, uh, you know, uh, I'll mention Bonfire, uh, Running Wild, Warrant Victory. These are the, all the bands from that early thing there. There was a little bit of a, um, just like when I get to Sweden, there's a little bit of a new wave of Swedish heavy metal. Germany, you know, 84, 85, you start getting three or four record labels. Um, and you get bands like uh, Gravestone, Iron Angel, Living Death, Mad Max, Mekong Delta, or yeah, Running Wild, Warrant, 
um, the German warrants. So you get some some heavier stuff getting into a little more of a, a deathy, thrashy thing. Yep. But you also get more and more of this uh, of this post new wave of gravestones. A great example of this post new wave of British heavy metal sound. Of course, there was Night Sun Morning early on. Power metal, Blind Guardian, Halloween, Freedom Call, Brainstorm, Ga- Gamma Ray, Primal Fear, Iron Savior, Pink Cream sixty nine. A lot of that is all the same family of bands, right? All together. Um, but yeah, there you go. So Germany always the 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 fifth in line um of this uh of this acceptability if you're an English speaking and and you know en- English only tolerating uh metalhead. What's really interesting about Germany and about this example is like with the exception of Klaus from the Scorpions, and then eventually Michael Kiske with Halloween, who joins up for their second album. Most of the vocalists are a little on the gruff side, would you say, right? This, you, you, I mean, I, I think a lot of these bands, you know, look at like, except Gravedigger, certainly, because Gravedigger is one of the earlier of the power metal bands to come out of Germany. Um, none of those bands ever really made it really, really big here. And I think it's probably due to the vocal style of these bands. It definitely there's a harshness to to their vocals that um might be a blocker for some people whereas klaus never really sang like that right klaus had a very very easily acceptable vocal style i think for most english-speaking folks and i think that kind of helped them quite a bit let's also bring up as well the other concept that you get with this this show's concept is the is the idea of uh, having pretty bad lyrics because they're they're english as second language lyrics and you got you got Defi helping accept and you've got Herman Rarebell who's you know both sides he's he's you know partly in London partly in in Germany so he's he's the guy who's kind of helping along the lyrics the best there but you get some amusing lines you get you know you get lines there's there's so many classic lines in accept and scorpions that you kind of laugh at and and think are really bad and then there's other ones you go Nobody would have said that in English, but it sounds kind of cool. And you're repeating it. It's oh, kind of cool that they said that, right? Uh, it's just weird, right? So, so yeah, you get a little bit of both. But yeah, that's something you get with all these bands, of course, when they do do their English uh, uh, vocals. You know, they're they're up for a lot of ridicule because uh, because you know they, they sound like they sound like eight year olds, basically, right? Yeah, yeah. Which is interesting. So my pick for Germany was Rammstein. And to me, it almost defies like everything else we're talking about, because the the international popularity of this band almost just kind of happens by, you know, you, you, you stop and think about it. It's like, how is how is this band so popular? Right. You know, they sing in yeah. German in German. The vocals are very kind of guttural and hard and angry, which gives the songs like a very kind of harsh, jarring, caustic feel, right? But yet people love these guys, right? And you mentioned the the rhythmic aspect, right? So the, the beats and the industrial coldness of the music and it's big, it's bombastic, it's riff heavy. It's just, but it, the music is very choppy and just, I don't know, personally, I don't enjoy Rammstein at all. And I, I never have. And I keep trying to think maybe something will click, but I just, I can't get past the vocal delivery. I can't, the, the music to me, it's all very, very similar. But most people you talk to, it's like they they don't even care that the music, that the vocals are in German. Doesn't matter. They, you know, when you go to see, not that I've been to a Rammstein concert, but when you go and you watch footage of, I mean, people are just going berserk in the stands, just getting along to this band. It's almost like they don't care what the lyrics are about. They don't care if they're singing in German, English, Japanese. It doesn't matter to them. There is something about the music that just transfixes everybody. And that's all that really matters. Right. So somehow that, you know, all the explosions, all the great stage show, all that it's become like this whole event for them and has, it's nothing to do with whether they're singing in German or English. So it's interesting. Yeah. They to defy yeah. any, everything else we're talking about here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, my next, uh, my next country to visit here is Brazil with Sepultura. I forgot to take out my props, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting one where again, you definitely get a real personality out of this country. Like what we, what we feel that we get out of it as Westerners or, you know, go, go straight up North from, uh, from Brazil is, uh, is, 
is a little bit of the uh, you know the urban blight and the uh, the the hard uh, the harshness you know Cogumelo Records you think of you think of their death metal scene basically your your deathy thrashy black blackened death thrash whatever well that's that's a term for much later but it's almost like a very rudimentary version of thrash crossed with death metal as as some of their more famous bands sort of early on and you've got you've got um where they call it uh, rdp rados de porio so you got your crossover thing sarcophago christian of course is uh you know your your next big band af- after sepultura um but you know it's cool sepultura is is singing in english so that's that's good for us right um but also um i think what you get out of them which is kind of interesting as a foreign territory band is you get um you get sort of a uh, an interesting um uh adherence to repetition from that early stuff it seems really brutal and cool and and there's something about it sounds exotic and you got that anger in max's voice and and the portuguese accent on the english lyrics seems to work really good right so you you're you're kind of going along with it you're you're fine with it right you're just you're reminded that it's from another country pretty exotic country in terms of being non-western um but you're loving it at the same time and then you know they're kind of like these world conquerors who are coming up and moving up here and getting on Roadrunner and, and doing well and making these really cool records, Arise, Chaos AD, Roots, uh, and and um, and you're loving it, right? So so that's kind of cool. Uh, and then later on, you've got, um, well, actually early on was still uh, Dorsal Atlantica. Um, but yeah, you get Angra later on, right? Uh, so you get a little bit of power metal, but probably not a lot. So yeah, I, I'd say the big personality that you get out of Brazil is is dominated by Sepultura crossed with Christian and Cogumelo Records. Uh, just the whole idea of this uh, of this of this brutal cavemanish sort of thrash uh, from those early albums, and then them them staying staying sort of violent and urban. Um, it, it feels urban, even though we think of Brazil as the Amazon and all that, right? But it actually feels really urban, uh, is, is what you get out of those guys. So, and all those bands have managed to utilize little bits of like traditional Brazilian ethnic instrumentation and yeah. Latin flavors in their music too. So every now and then you'll get this little kind of Brazilian jazzy thing or whatever, and it's like it's it's, it's kind of cool, right? To us, we're like, oh wow. They, they, they have this brutal fast paced song and they threw that little thing in there. It's like, how cool is that? And all of them do that. And I think that's very, very typical of bands from that, from uh, Brazil that do that. And it's like, it's almost like it's expected, like the music of Angra. Angra did that all the time. They would like throw these little bits in there. It's like, oh, that's kind of clever, right? So that there's that yeah. too as well for the appeal factor. But but it feels like it's often about poverty and class and politics and social change and upheaval and all that stuff, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. All right, let's go to Finland for my next choice, uh, Amorphous, right? So early on in their career, like I think on the demo in the first EP, they sang in, in their native language, but then they, you know, very shortly thereafter went to all English and incorporating both death metal and clean vocals with most of, you know, a good chunk of their lyrical content, especially early on, was uh, you know, the way they interpret the epic poem from Finland called the uh, Kalevala, I believe is how it's pronounced. And, you know, to most people outside of Finland, uh, what the hell is that, right? Well, why do I care about that? But the way these guys crafted their albums, which again, death metal and traditional metal and progressive metal and folk and all this stuff coming together, you know, they had to have, because they incorporated both the growling vocals and the clean vocals, they had to have singers who could really do those both well, or a guy who could do both well. So the more popular they got, they kept switching vocalists until they found someone who really could appeal to just about anybody. And that's Tommy Jatson. So, you know, early on, you had uh, the more brutal stuff like Tales from uh, Thousand Lakes, which is, you know, their early, early classics, kind of doomy. It's death metal, it's folk, it's prog, it's all sorts of stuff. You know, vocals are kind of like, all right, there they are what they are. But then, you know, over time, all of a sudden they're putting out like the string of albums. I mean, Tommy has been in the band now for 18 years. And I don't know many people, whether you're into like death metal or not, who who listen to any of the albums that he has sang on and hasn't said, wow, that guy can really sing on the clean vocals, the melodic vocals. He's he can sing alongside anyone anyone and he does great death metal growls too you can pretty much understand everything he's saying when he's growling and i think that uh over the course of their career they've tried very very hard to make their you know because they've gotten more and more popular over the years 
to make their music so that basically anybody from any market can get into their to their songs and to their albums and they have found the right singer there uh but you know what's it's really interesting and we'll, we'll talk about more of this when we get into norway it's it, when you talk to like hardcore fans of some of these bands from some of these countries there's always a very fondness for the early music when they sang in their native tongue. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to the other Scandinavian countries, but yeah, Finland amorphous, another good example of this. And again, yeah. people love them. And uh, you know, sometimes a little bit of accent on the English delivery, but it almost like it doesn't matter, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Fin Finland is a country. I mean, remember I, I went over there for a whole metal conference. Yeah. A bunch of us were over there. I mean, you really learned that they actually, they treat, they treat music as an expert, as an export at a governmental level. Right. Uh, and so they have all sorts of famous bands and, and bands that everybody loves. So so you talk about a country that punches above its weight uh, in terms of delivering, uh, you know, rock and roll culture of, of all sorts. Uh, Finland's definitely definitely one of those. But uh, OK, so my next one is uh, Japan with loudness. So we've got some. Uh, here we go. A collection of those disillusion this is kind of an important one to uh, in terms yeah. of concept and then this is even earlier but the idea you know i think of this album um so japan is obviously one of the most hermetically sealed countries it's an it's an island it's got its own it's got its own language and and super super distinct culture um so so when you think of, uh, you know, exporting music from there, I mean, I remember the early days of, you know, Loudness is kind of, I guess, considered the, the biggest band, really. Um, you know, I've, I've got a few other to mention here. But um, one thing I definitely noticed with Loudness is that you 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 definitely got that whole idea of exotic chord changes and interesting things. And you think of Akira as a guitarist and how amazing he is and, and the stuff he did. So this is this is almost like a country that 75 percent of the time when they were breaking rules, you were going, wow, nobody in the West is doing that. And that is really cool. Of course, when you go earlier, um, you know, well, even even to bow, wow, but but um, mm -hmm. But you think of uh, you think of um, Flower Traveling Band or any of that sort of stuff. So sometimes it can have a real and even more of an Oriental flavor where it just sounds kind of sour and doesn't fit in rock and roll sort of thing. So you will get that um, with with these countries as well. But as time goes on, you know, Japan just does. And they have such extreme personalities that they put into so much of this stuff that that you get some really, really kind of crazy bands. But uh, but OK, so no, not on the crazy end of things. You also had e, uh, EZO and Earthshaker, Lazy, Marino. These early ones, Doom, Sabre Bells, 54 Magnums early. Church of Misery, Boris. So you're starting to get into Boris and Sai. You're, you're starting to get into extreme stuff and, and doom. And so, so at this point, when you've got these bands, they're doing really super interesting things. Yeah. And probably because it is from this really exotic, hermetically sealed culture, right? Uh, um, so Japan is a, is a good example. Anthem, uh, Anthem, X Japan are big as well. But uh, yeah, Hannah Metal is kind of a funny situation where you get in Rudy and some, some Westerners in there as well. Um, and we all know Marty Friedman moved over there and he became yep. a big star doing all kinds of stuff. But yeah, so, so they've, they've, you know, put, put out some really good bands. And then of course um, the, you know, the big thing, why loudness is so known is, is they did start singing in English and, and, you know, recording uh, who is this with uh, who produces, I think it's Max Norman. Yeah. Max Norman. Max Norman. So this sounds like a very Western album, um, but you still hear, you still hear the accent and stuff. So you're distracted by that, but it's, but it's, yeah, they're, they're trying to make an assault on, uh, on America essentially so yeah that's my favorite of all those although Psy man Psy is one of those bands you could just spend you know so much time with and go this is wacky this is yeah. so cool and creepy you could just that's a that's a retirement band where you could say I'm just gonna spend a couple of months with Psy and that's listen it. to nothing else and <laughs> see what it does to my personality right <laughs> Yeah, Sai's one of those bands you listen to and you're like, wow, it's like this is wild stuff. I'm not sure if I'm liking it or not, but it's just you can't ignore it, right? It's just so yeah. cool. And I'm glad you mentioned Church of Misery, because that's a band I've really been getting into lately. This is their brand new one that just came out. And if you if you never told me they were Japanese just by listening to them, you would never know. But then once you find it out, you're like, okay. And then you start to listen for little, you know, Japanese elements in their music, yeah. whatever. That Japanese band playing Doom to me is such a cool thing. Um 
And I, I, I want to just touch on before I go into my pick for Japan, I want to touch on the loudness thing. So I remember when loudness were first starting to make some rumbles here in the States. And I remember getting Disillusion and Akira's solo album before Thunder in the East came out. I remember, you know, I think I was a freshman at college or something. And we used to have this uh, out in the student union building every month or something. This, these vendors would come and sell records and things. And I remember reading about Akira in one of the guitar magazines. So I was like, oh, that's the that's the loudness stuff. So I bought Disillusion. I might have got, what's the one that came right before it, Martin? I can picture the cover, but I can't. Um, oh, with, the little baby, with the little baby on the front, the, the fetus on the oh, front. Yeah, that's I, is, is, this one right before not oh. that one the other one where oh. the baby's kind of like floating on the, I, I forget the name of it i don't oh, know yeah okay whatever uh and the and the tusca jaguar which was akira's first solo album. so i bought them all ne having never heard a note of any of it and i remember like putting it on and hearing the japanese vocals and i was like instantly turned off i love the guitar playing but i was kind of like oof yeah this is kind of not for me and then when thunder in the east came out uh you know i heard the, oh they're singing in english now so i bought that and i was like all of a sudden now it was okay. Right. I could really, cause I really enjoyed that album, but yeah, the, the it was a little bit of a distraction here because really heavily accented English. You could tell that they probably learned and probably went through excruciating times trying to make sure to pronounce everything as it was supposed to be pronounced and whatnot. So yeah, a little, that was a little bit of a blocker. I, I, I forgot to mention one thing I wanted to mention. Um, it was our understanding that these records all sounded really good and, and we kind of put that down to the fact that you know most of the whole recording industry equipment was was invented over there right yeah. i mean so so i think that i think they generally have really good studios people can correct me if i'm wrong but um you know these records generally sounded pretty good for that reason and that and that's why you got a lot of live albums out of japan too uh because yeah. they recorded those live shows really good for those western bands right yeah for sure so my pick for Japan is a really, really obscure prog band, right? The band is called Mandrake. This is the only album they ever came out with. It's called Unreleased Materials Volume 1. I don't think they ever made a Volume 2. Uh, basically, the lead singer is this guy named Susumo Hirasawa. Um, it's all in Japanese, all big. There's only four tracks on here. Each one is like, you know, 14, 19 minutes long, whatever. And you got keyboards and guitars. And it's really bombastic, complicated prog. But man, the Japanese vocals kind of just cut through the mix like a like a sword, you know. It's just like all of a sudden he starts singing, and I'm like, ah, alrighty then. Um, to my ears, the vocals are really harsh. He's got an aggressive tone that kind of borders on the operatic, and to me, it's just not as pleasing on the ears as other non-English speaking vocals from other countries where. You know, you can deal with the bombasticness of it and, you know, the operaticness of it. But for me, it totally doesn't work here. But more importantly, I don't find and I used to have this issue with the, the loudness albums, too, in Japanese. I don't find the vocals to be very melodic and which hinders my overall enjoyment of the music. I mean, I very rarely ever listen to this because of that. I love the music, but every time he starts singing, I'm kind of like, uh, so and I think that's what it is, too. It's like I think we can enjoy non-english language vocals as long as they're melodic when they cease to be melodic that can be an issue right even though again we're, we're people who like non-melodic vocals like extreme metal and whatnot so it's it's kind of strange right how how we can have a blocker put up for one aspect and not for another right because i think for a lot of people japanese vocals death metal growls doesn't matter they're they're all no good right but yet i can say i love death metal growls yet Japanese vocals eh, don't really sit well with me. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, Pete, I'm going to blast through my next five because I don't want to keep you all day. And I've got a cool bonus that people are going to really like uh, at the end. So, so I'm just going to blast through these five, if that's okay with you Yep. and I'll do, I'll do it pretty quick. So uh, yeah. Cause, cause we've got pretty ambitious with this. We picked 10 each, right? <laughs> and we thought we might not have a full hour for this, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And now, and now we're leaning on that full hour already. So, so yeah, uh, Gorky park, I just wanted to mention quickly for Russia and, and Eastern Europe. I mean, this whole, this is almost where we get one of the biggest disasters of this whole foreign foreign language bands things when you think of these eastern bloc countries 
countries and Russia because it was so it was so um, you know closed off from Western culture. Everything was contraband, so they really sounded behind the times. They looked ridiculous. They looked like Slade and Sweet practically. Right, the 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 fashion sense was so horrible with with all of these uh, these Eastern Bloc bands, right? But of course, that has turned around completely as well, and now now they're making you know real interesting forward thinking sort of music but yeah back then it was always that the eastern block was was one that you really sort of um looked at a bit negatively uh my next one is sweden um you know at just like germany we just always felt that um these bands uh were were doing really good things uh and and having an advantage because of them being the non-western thing but they're all they're all singing in um they're all singing in english as well love torch to death um, you know, so this is like an 83, 84, 85 ish sort of band. Uh, the first Europe album and all Europe is all good stuff, but just totally English sounding. But again, Geronimo riffs, right? Teutonic, Frostcore, we used to call it as kids, right? New wave of Swedish heavy metal. I loved how they all had just like kind of the straight long hair like that. I mean, look at those guys, eh? Um, and, um, do I have any more Swedish here? No, I guess I guess not. But, uh, you know, 220 volt, I love to death. Axe switch, heavy load sort of starts it all off in the English language. And before that, remember Jan Starkey, he did that big coffee table book. There's a whole history of bands even singing in uh, in Swedish and uh, and doing prog and metal and stuff like that. Uh, Poland, Vader, uh, Vader and uh, where's all my Vader stuff here. So Poland is kind of known for the uh, the brutal death metal, like the amazing good stuff they did with this stuff. Right. And uh, Behemoth or Behemoth or however Behemoth, you want to, yeah. um, you know, so two massive big bands from Bo Poland. Um, so, yeah, they, they're kind of known for uh, maybe it's a little bit like the um, the the Brazilian thing for some reason. Uh, that was big, uh, sort of from Poland. Uh, decapitated. Hey, TSA early on was a big one there. Uh, Denmark, Merciful Fate. So there's a there's this is still in print. My first Merciful Fate book. Great um, book. Yeah, thank you. Um, but yeah, so so Denmark, uh, it's small. It didn't it didn't produce a lot. But you also felt just being a Scandinavian country, they did a pretty good job. Merciful Fate, you never you know you never faulted them. You even thought maybe they were so amazing and so talented right out of the gates. Uh, you know, with Melissa being like almost like the first best album since Sad Wings of Destiny. You almost thought, well, number one, they sold their soul to the devil. So that's why they were so good more than anything. But, you know, maybe this Denmark thing. Wow. Is there something in the water in Denmark that makes this band so amazing? Um, and then you get to Norway again, known for the black metal, of course, uh, as well. And you and you don't there's no faulting of Norway or thinking it's behind the times or whatever. You're just thinking this is exotic and strange and weird and, uh, and, and pretty cool that they could do all this. Um, I think that's, uh, that's all I had for, uh, for my countries. Uh, what else do we have to show here? What else? What is this? I uh, just other lo loose props here and there. What do we got? That's a Vader album. Um, yeah, so that's it. Well, there's a merciful fate, but yeah. So, so essentially, um, yeah, um, just to put just to put them in a big group together. Belgium's a funny one. Belgium is your your like your French biker metal, a little bit deathy, a little bit growly and thrashy. But but yeah, you put your Denmark and your Netherlands together, and your and your Finland and Norway and Sweden, and and you get this block of uh, of countries where you, you you're kind of accept, accepting them in. Maybe they're after Germany, um, but you're generally thinking. You're you're mostly doing cool moves because you're from a non English country and and there's nothing really embarrassing coming out of it. You're actually just better. So, yeah, I mean the whole Norway thing is really interesting because you got the whole black metal story, right? Um, you know, enslaved and Dimmu Borgia and Emperor and all these bands, Immortal and whatnot. I mean, you know, in the early like Dimmu albums had the Norwegian vocals. You know, it's all these Viking stories all about the cold forest and woodlands and you know same thing with enslaved the early albums are all sung in their native tongue it's all it's all this viking tales and things like that but again this band just kept growing in popularity and now they, it's like they do the all english vocals you got clean and melodic vocals and but again i go back to uh, we talked about it i think with the the finnish thing it's like you know how many like longtime black metal fans really cherish those early albums from a lot of these bands before they started singing in english it's like that's it's untouched right that's that's mm -hmm. the way it's supposed to sound right though it yeah. should be sung in the scandinavian vocals you know on the prog side sweden got anglogard you know they've only done three studio albums 
This is the only album, the first album uh, that has Swedish vocals. And they're kind of, you know, the, the guitar player, his name is Tord Linden. He's not really a very good singer. So the vocals aren't all that great, but yet the music is so herky jerky and, you know, it's got bits of Tull and King Crimson and Vandergraaf Generator and all this kind of wonderful stuff that you don't mind when he starts singing because it's kind of like loopy and, and kind of complicated as everything else is. So you don't really mind it. But then they never did vocals again after that. Uh, I do want to talk about uh, the French Canadians, right? So you got uh, Harmonium and Manege who sing in in in, Fran in French, but there's a big difference when the Canadians do it as opposed to the French, right? So when when the Canadians are singing in French, it's lush, it's pastoral, it's kind of folky, and it just kind of floats along, and the music is kind of similar. So it, it you know as opposed to the French prog bands who were going for a more theatrical kind of delivery with everything music and vocals the french are a little more laid back and, and just kind of like you know taking things taking it slow uh and last but not least i want to talk about italy i was going to talk about them first but they're they're better safe for last so lots of italian prog bands right there's italian metal bands as well i'm going to stick on prog here so i picked two bands to kind of highlight here one is pfm or permiata fornario marconi who in early on, all their albums were sung in Italian. All right, so here are two of their, you know, Peru Namico and Storia de Un Minuto, arguably their two best. Uh, almost folky delivery here. The Italian accent is there, but it's a really nice, pleasing uh, Italians, very romantic. All members of the band sing, but, you know, Franco Musito is the main vocalist. So it's just like the vocals are just another part of the overall ensemble of the music. Uh, they went and did a couple of albums with English vocals. They basically took a lot of the songs from the first couple albums and they uh, sang them in English with, they had, uh, what, uh, what's his face? Pete Sinfield, I believe, helped them out to translate. And so now all of a sudden you got these guys who don't speak any English singing some of their songs that they've already recorded in Italian and English. Uh, and here you got uh, The World Became the World and Photos of Ghosts. Honestly, I would I, I almost never listen to these because I would rather hear them singing in Italian. It's just it sounds more natural. This sounds forced and unnatural. On the same token, another very, very notable band from Italy is Banco, Banco del Muto Socorso, right? So here, the vocals, the music, much more bombastic and operatic. Uh, and while the romantic aspect of the delivery of the music and the vocals is still there, you know right off the bat, right off the bat, you're listening to an Italian band because the vocals are so high in the mix. They're such an integral part of the of the music alongside the keyboards and the guitars and all that kind of stuff. So these guys also did an English language album called Banco. Doesn't quite work. Again, when you're used to hearing it, even if you don't understand what the hell they're singing about, you know there's something about the feel of the Italian vocals, and now they're trying to give you those same songs, but singing in a language they're not comfortable with, and it sounds like it. And uh, Francesco Di Giacomo was the classic vocalist for uh, Banco, one of the greats of all time. And you got to listen to these bands. The Italian bands, you have to listen to them sing in, in Italian. It, to me, it does not work at all when they try to mm. sing interesting yeah but, yeah I, I remember having those i had three vanadian albums at what vanadium albums at one point the italian deep purple they were called right and you and you were very distracted by his accent uh although they were in english right but yeah. and it's funny austria the big joke used to be for years that no no rock and roll ever came from austria now there's some famous bands there south africa we got no bands uh really coming out uh greece is a, a little bit you know switzerland we've got you know celtic frost and crocus are the big ones but uh so my bonus is uh driving home the point you know i don't want to make fun of these bands and and you know oh, no, we're yeah. definitely not no. making fun you know we haven't gone and we're not reading you a bunch of embarrassing except lyrics or anything like that right but so this is funny so um so basically, um, you know, for years and years, I have, I've had shelved in my computer. I've, I've been wanting to put out a book of metal lists. Right. And it's it's got, got these massive files that, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds, maybe 300 lists. Right. And Josh Wood was helping me from Calgary and stuff. But the problem is I never get around to it. Right. And then every list goes out of date over time. Right. So so it's like, oh, geez, now we got to now we got to update. But so some some of the funny ones I have here that drives home the point of, of, of the whole English as second language thing. So we've got 20th funniest 
Indonesian metal band names. Uh, 24 Hours, Ignorant Flea, Grill Salmon, Yeah Yeah Whacked, Connie Dio, uh, Outside Fire, Stupid Sound, Sucker Head, Radical Corpse, uh, A Better of Satan, Great Session, <laughs> uh, Acid Speed Band, uh, Bandung Sound of Noise, Jet Liar, um, Deformed Tartarus, Black Boots, Freedom of Rhapsodia, 10 Funniest Japanese Metal Band Names, Fly to Egg. Oh, yeah. Great band, actually. Yeah. Panda Kick, Bang Doll, Food Brain, Manipulated Slaves, Real Tension, Hard Gear, Death Torsion, <laughs> uh, Cinderella Search, Brave Bomber, <laughs> 10 Funniest Korean Metal Band Names, Crying Nut, PP Longstocking, Heavy Angels, Soul Mothers, <laughs> Jay Walker, The Sleeping Eight, <laughs> uh, Yellow Kitchen, Weeper, Monkey Head, No Brain, 20 Funniest Malaysian Metal Band Names, Nice Stupid Playground, <laughs> uh, Coffin Cancer, Damage Digital, Mortuary Ancestor, Predicate Not Define, Rogue Covet, Woe Begone Zephyr, Loving Born, Tri Reich, Vociferation Eternity, Suffocation, Marlin Spike, Slum Scum, Blind Tribe, Cross Overdrive, Steel Fingers, Inside Wild Child, Dreaded, Handy Black, Infectious Maggots. How many more we got here? Ah, four more here. <laughs> Funniest Philippine metal band names Cactus Butt, Dazed Biscuits. <laughs> uh, abrasive relation, squirrel talk, bagang, public nails, death after birth, dying accent, cracker nut and spinach, <laughs> daisy spin wheels, the electrum, ethnic face, gypsy grind, legally illegal. <laughs> uh, well, none of these bands have never been heard from again. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's driving home the point that 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 yeah if you. And like us, if we tried to do anything in German or French or Spanish, we would fall flat on our face. We could we'd say some stupid things and they'd be like bending over, you know, laughing at us. Right. Pedro's cannabis. <laughs> Fossil fuel. Half life, half death. Visceral organs. Wet paint. Rumble belly. Pound yard. Genital grinder. Mad fish. Uh, funniest Thai metal band names. More funning. Smile Buffalo. Van Harmon, Man Strinkle, <laughs> Doomed Today, The Gut of Madness, Nameless Author, Modern Dog, Human Rock, Blackhead, Stone Metal Fire, Heavy Mod, Whippelard, Death Guy, Flesh and Skin, Funniest Turkish Metal Band Names, Diabolic Yard, Scrofula, I love that one, <laughs> Helican, Pogo's Not Fight, Knight Errant, Witch Trap, Ominous Grief, Something's wrong. Vintage solemnity. Neoplast. Angel skull. Anti silence. Ethereal travel. Aphrodisiac. Took me a lot of work finding these in almost the pre-internet age. It was. I, I remember working on this. It, it was. It was a lot of. Uh, uh, yeah. It was a hassle. Um, what do we got here? Twenty-five funniest South American and Mexican metal band names. Hazy Hamlet. Jury lands. Leprechaun. Pertubator. Six beer. I love that one. Six beer. <laughs> Bloodthirsty. Sad theory. Funeral putrid. Fungus. Crazy lazy. Dust from misery. The family ghost. Sash window. Not just any window. A sash window. <laughs> um, Anthropophagical warfare. Tears of Joker. The sweet leaf. Liar symphony. Mr. Powerful. Dark half. Faces of madness. Harpia. Creeping soul. Alligator attack. Death slave and nothing to declare. So there you go. Wow. There's there's the pitfalls of uh, of trying to do English when it's not your first language, right? There's, there's some gems there. Holy <laughs> moly. Yeah. Like I said, none of these bands have ever been heard from ever again. <laughs> Gee, what a surprise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Maybe this is the first time some of those names have been said on the internet ever. Jim, you're probably right. <laughs> Imagine one of them is watching. Hey, I was in that band. It's like... <laughs> 
<laughs> if, if anybody yeah. is watching who wasn't one of those bands, please put some comments down below about yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, what it was like to be in a band called that, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, man, that's too funny. Thanks for sharing, Martin. That was, that, that was yeah. good. Yeah, I can, I can only imagine what it must have been like to kind of put that list together. Back. So when, when when was that? What year was that that you did that? Oh, I mean, I started working on that book probably in the late 90s. And then Josh and I picked it up again and he did so much more research. Josh is awesome with these lists. And he's made good use of them because he's written some really cool articles and he posts a lot of cool stuff on the net. But yeah, I've got I've got 300 of these lists like this crazy, crazy list. But unfortunately, they're kind of all out of date. Right. If I if I put it out, just make me look like the old man that I am. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, everybody. So uh, we've got some homework for all of you. So I, I think what I would like to know is if you are one of the folks who really can't listen to bands who don't sing in English language, I, I think we'd love to know why. Like, what are the blockers? What are the reasons why? I mean, is it just you just can't you can't even accept the music and because the singing is is not in English? And if you are someone who's pretty acceptable to either band singing their own native tongue or with heavily accented English, uh, let us know why it doesn't bother you, you know? So uh, it'd be cool to hear from everybody because I think that's kind of the point of this whole episode is like why some of us can accept these sort of things and why some of these bands make it huge even though they're, you know, their English is really poor or they make it really huge and they don't sing in English at all, right? Even in, in even the non-English or the English-speaking countries accept our accepting of it too so i think it just is kind of a cool conversation i think i think this was a really good topic so and there's plenty of other bands that we didn't mention right these are just some of the ones that are familiar to us so uh martin uh what's uh new on the podcast front and got any new contrarians episodes or books in stock and that kind of thing i wonder how many countries we offended today but uh we'll oh yeah we'll find out. lord only knows yeah <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're not trying to offend anybody really we're just you know it's you know we're, we're just trying to point out some things and spur on conversation i think sometimes it gets lost on people it's like, like yeah, we're, yeah like we're yeah. trying to do something we're, we're really not it's just you know yeah because yeah. this is oh yeah I've, I've got the audio podcast of course history and five songs with martin popoff we've got our youtube channel the contrarians and uh i write a lot of books and that's all at martinpopoff.com i'll sign them send them out paypal buttons for all that so there you go yeah, very cool. And uh, that book that Martin flashed before, that Merciful Faith book, if you have not read it, I would highly recommend it if you are a fan of the band. I, I have read many a Martin Popoff book in my time. As Martin knows, I've got shelves of them over there. Uh, and I, I love a lot of them, but I will say that Merciful Faith one is one of my favorites. So happy you have that back in stock. So if you haven't gotten it, get on over to martinpopoff.com and get yourself a copy. You will not regret it. It's quite, quite good. So all right what do we got coming up here on the channel uh three o'clock today ken golden's coming into the uh zoom with me we're going to talk about some new releases coming out today that ken will be stocking over at laser's edge so if you're interested in all the latest and greatest in prog and fusion and power metal and progressive metal that that show uh ken will run down everything that he's got available so if you're looking out for any new release from your favorite band or a new release from a band you haven't listened to yet that you might love that's the show to watch we got that coming up today and then on sunday we're Ken, eh? Ken's probably watching this and thinking, what a couple of amateurs, right? Because Ken, Ken really knows this stuff well, right? So, oh, yeah, he's he's big on all yeah. the international stuff. Yeah, he's, uh, yeah, for yeah. sure. <laughs> for sure. Um, Ken, so there's a perfect example of someone who it doesn't matter what they're singing in right it's he's very very open to all that so but that not everybody's that way. That's I think that's the point of this whole discussion, right? Um, Ranking the albums of Griffin coming up on Sunday. So the really quirky British prog folk bands from the 70s. And they're back today. They've released a couple albums in recent years. So I'll be ranking that catalog on Sunday. And then Sunday evening, The Curse of the Collector is back. Our monthly show where myself and some of my favorite panelists will talk about some of the cool oddities and things that we have picked up over the last month for those people who just the curse of buying new music related stuff is never ending so the curse is indeed real so tune in for sunday night for that and of course martin popoff will will be back with me next week here at the funhouse so till then this is on the web at www.seatranquility.org we're on facebook we're on youtube all together all the damn time please subscribe if you haven't already and click on that notification bell so you get alert of all of our content as it posts and please if you would hit that like button before you leave thanks everybody for watching for martin popoff imp Pardo, have a good weekend, everybody. We'll see you next week here at the Funhouse. Bye-bye.